Good. So what I want to do is to talk about some of the changes that are facing us when it comes to ICT in primary education. Um, where I'm aiming to head over the next half hour or so is to talk a little about this sort of waterfall development methodology and to think about how curriculum works if one thinks in those terms, then talk about a sort of more iterative planning cycle for developing an ICT curriculum, and then spend the last 10 minutes or so, we'll see how the time goes, talking about a much more agile approach to developing an ICT curriculum. So that's the, the, the broad plan of this. There's so much I want to talk about that I am going to get carried away, but please interrupt. This works much, much better as conversation rather than presentation. So do please just say something or call out or, or you know, interrupt. Feel free to interrupt. So we have this model of how software gets developed, which is, I think, how an awful lot of what we've done in terms of curriculum gets developed too. We start by thinking about what the requirements are, what we want to achieve with this. We design a curriculum. We give it to school teachers for them to implement this. OK, once in a while, we do a little bit of testing or assessment or what did we used to call it marking that was it and we sort of keep the thing ticking over so we have this sort of big picture let's start at the top with a set of requirements well if we're going to do it that way then we have to ask the question that Doug Belshaw is asking in purpose ed what is the purpose of education what is education for does anybody want to volunteer an answer before we go on we're amongst friends it's a small room I can turn the recorder off if you want <coughs> I take it you all do know that. Right, Pete, what do you think it's for? It's either Ooh. to create economic capital so that my pension is paid. Well, this is important. Can we have other people's pension too? Or just... It's for the love of learning and personal growth. Can you do both? Is it either or? Sort of intention and sort of time I suspect that from the top down, economic well-being for the society as a whole is something that does matter. But I think for many of us, do we not feel that love of learning is an important thing? That, that getting children very excited about the things that we're excited about, about learning stuff. Um, Doug has this lovely Purpose Ed thing running. This is the sort of wordle of many of the tweets about Purpose Ed. And you've got some gorgeous, gorgeous ideas in there. Look at that about debate and about potential. Uh, those of you who are in school, does your school's mission statement say something about each child shall develop their individual potential or achieve their individual potential, yeah? They very rarely put that on the, um, the, the mission statements. I just worry a little. Um, I mean, I, we have a, a year and a half old, almost year and a half old daughter, and her nursery school has a mission statement about each child achieving their individual potential. I just worry a little about Sophie achieving her individual, uh, her individual potential by the time she leaves nursery. I think there's, there's, there's time for growth beyond that, but you never know. Um, this was the one which really made a big impression on me when I was trained to be a teacher, which Rich Peters talking about this notion of rational autonomy. That he says it's the cons when we think about the purpose of education, we think about what it means to be educated. And our notion of the educated person is somebody who can take delight in a variety of pursuits, whose whole conduct of life is transformed by that degree of all-round understanding. And I think that's what I have back at the back of my mind in terms of purpose of education, about having an education which teaches people, teaches children, young people to think for themselves, to ask questions as well as to know answers. Um, and I am conscious that this is very much an individual approach and we ought to also acknowledge a social dimension to it. But that, that's the one that works for me. Are you aware of the aims of the national curriculum? put on the spot, what's the purpose of the national curriculum? What does it say education is for? Well, if we have a look inside, we get these two. This is still the statutory stuff for the primary sector because we never sort of went ahead with the, the revision that was proposed. School curriculum should aim to provide opportunities for all pupils to learn and to achieve. Is there anybody in the room who would care to disagree with that? You can't really, can you? I mean, it's kind of stating the obvious. I, suspect. And then we go into a little more detail, aim to promote people's spiritual, moral, social, cultural development, prepare all pupils for the opportunities, responsibilities and experiences of life. It's all good apple pie stuff, but we do have those aims at the core of it. How does this get worked out in practice? We end up, of course, as you know, with the grid, the subject-based approach to that. There are other ways of achieving these aims 
without dividing a curriculum up into subjects and labeling some of these things core subjects, some of these things foundation subjects. So I don't think that move from one to the other is necessarily that clear. Sir Jim Rose, or those people acting on his behalf, did a jolly fine job of thinking about, OK, let's rethink this. Let's think about putting, those, well, putting children at the heart of the curriculum, at the centre of the curriculum, and then starting with the aims about responsible citizens, confident individuals, successful learners, and working out from there. And notice, please, where they put ICT on this. They're at the heart, almost at the heart of the curriculum as one of the, what the core subjects as something which was essential for learning and life. And then six areas of learning, notice ICT isn't mentioned in any of those which, which wrap around that. Things have moved on from there. There are other approaches available. This was the one suggested in the Cambridge Primary Re Review, that we start with a set of aims again, and they've got a list of 12 aims there. And again, I don't think there's anything on there that we're going to disagree with. Autonomy makes it onto that list, which I was pleased to see, and then outworked into a set of eight domains. Notice that they didn't include ICT on that list. Although we do have the arts, we do have creativity, we do have technology, but... Um, Alexander's view was very much that ICT is part of literacy, this notion that we were hearing yesterday about literacy or digital literacy as part of literacy. As I say, other approaches are available. The International Baccalaureate's Primary Years Programme, I think this is really exciting, very much driven by an inquiry-based approach. Six subject areas, I suppose, but also six transdisciplinary themes running ar around that which happen year on year as children work their way through the primary phase. And then we have the International Primary Curriculum, the IPC, which is really quite a detailed document which talks about particular topics and has a number of subjects worked out within those cross-curricular those, those, uh, cross topic areas. ICT, something of a Cinderella, is mentioned in a few, but by no means all, so seen as a tool for learning rather than as a domain of learning in its own right. And then we have the expert panel's review of the primary curriculum or review of the whole of the national curriculum. Where are we heading next? And they say, well, we keep much of it as it is. Still very much a subject-based approach, just as we have at the moment. They move some subjects out of the national curriculum and put them in something which they rather amusingly term the basic curriculum. So you'll notice that design and technology and information communication technology are removed from the national curriculum, which has statutory programs of study, into the basic curriculum where schools have to teach them, but they're not told what they have to teach in those subjects. The fact that both of those subjects contain the word technology in their title is, I'm sure, merely coincidence. There is concern expressed, though, with this approach, with what's happened to ICT on the primary curriculum. Anybody recognize the gentleman in the picture? Eric Schmidt, Google's executive chairman. Last summer, the McTaggart lecture. I mean, strictly speaking, it is taught. You know, you have sequences of instructions there on the program of study. You ought to have, I don't know, Googled that or something first. But, you know, he makes a point, and the point's probably worth making. And other people, the man behind Lara Croft, anybody? Ian Livingston, executive chairman of IDOS, former Roehampton education student, shh, I don't think he admits to that very much in public, um, and saying narrowness of how we teach children about computers, risk creating, this is strong words, isn't it? A generation of digital illiterates starving some of the UK's most successful industries of the talents they need to thrive. He's coming at it from a particular perspective, as indeed is Eric Schmidt, but digital illiterates, is that too strong a term? No, not too strong a term. Okay, go on. <laughs> okay, and I suppose what he's getting at here is an ICT curriculum that focuses merely on the reading skills, the using other people's software and not on the writing skills, the making software one yourself. 
Now, if we did the same thing with the English curriculum and just did reading and never any writing, that would be pretty close to illiteracy, I think. We look at our students at Roehampton. We do this um, audit when they join us at the beginning of their first year. These are people, many of whom are straight out of school. So they've, they've done primary school, secondary school, come to Roehampton to learn how to become school teachers, and we ask them what are their ICT skills like, and they say there's loads of this stuff which we're actually very, very good at. So the bottom half of the table, they're creating presentations, editing images, managing documents, hmm, using social social software, using email, we're pretty good at that. You know, using social, social software, 28% of them admit to a degree of expertise when it comes to that. Top of the graph there, not nearly so much. So programming, 65%, nearly two thirds of them say we've never done any programming. Well, that means they've not followed the national curriculum as it stands. Very few of them claiming any degree of sort of proficiency or expertise when it comes to interactive whiteboards. And yet these have been in their classrooms for at least 10 years or so, I would think. So not entirely digitally illiterate, I would suggest, but a sort of patchy distribution of skills over that list of things that we ask them about. Even more interesting, this year we introduced the question about how would you assess your level of knowledge? How would you assess your level of understanding? So skills, they're actually not at all bad. You know, two thirds of them, competent, proficient, or expert across that portfolio of skills. When it comes to understanding, we drop to less than a quarter competent, proficient, or expert on that portfolio, uh, or as they see their understanding, and that, I think, is cause for concern. You know, you couldn't get away with that in other subjects, just focusing on how you do things rather than about how it works. Do you understand the technology rather than can you merely use the technology? And look at this, over a third of them saying on the form, ticking the box for their lecturer, I have no understanding of ICT. That's ever so slightly disturbing after, for many of them, sort of 12, 12 years of compulsory education, 14 years of compulsory education. Hmm. Ofsted noticed these things too. The report came out last December. This is what they say about primary schools. Where the curriculum was inadequate, schools weren't delivering the full national curriculum, even as things stand, even when that's a statutory obligation on them. In one school, pupils reported that they learned more about ICT at home than at school. I think that's really surprising, isn't it? There was only one school where people said they learn more at home than at school. It's worse in the secondary sector, um, but our talk is about primary ICT this afternoon, so I'm not going to dwell on this. Um, but yeah, it is worse up there in the secondary sector. And then we have this man. Um, anybody recognize the man in the picture? Oh, well, bad luck, folks. <laughs> right, here we go. So this is the ministerial statement beginning of January, following on from the speech of the Bet Show. In order to facilitate more innovative provision for ICT, I'm going to make provision under the Act to say that schools do not have to follow the existing ICT programme study attainment targets at any of the key stages or the statutory assessment arrangements. Under this proposal, ICT remains a compulsory subject. Schools will be freed from the requirement to adhere to the existing programme study attainment targets and statutory assessment arrangements. So, in our waterfall development, we now move away from these are the requirements, this is how it's implemented, to a whole different kettle of fish where we've got to think about how do we move forward. I think that takes us into something which is much closer to an iterative development cycle of let's just look at what we've got and let's see how we can improve that. And there are lots of people interested in working with us to do that. So the expert panels recommendation. Well, they say ICT has moved from the national curriculum to the basic curriculum. Why is that? Because it has insufficient disciplinary coherence to be stated as a discrete and separate national curriculum subject. I think those are hard words. Do you not? Is that just me? <coughs> You know, what is the subject? How would we define ICT? Here's my attempt at a definition. Anything obvious I've missed out? Anybody like to argue with us? You're allowed to. 
<laughs> okay. Um, they also say that the programmes of study should state their aims. It's not just the curriculum that should be founded on aims, it's also each programme of study should be founded on aims. So, again, here's an attempt to say three for ICT education. This is what ICT should try to do, only my view. Again, I'll pause briefly to let people pick holes with this. Or tweet later if you want to pick holes. <laughs> um, so this is the curriculum as it stands for another, oh, I don't know, what are we now? Another five, six months or so. It breaks the subject down into these areas. You'll notice developing ideas, making things happen. That includes all of that secret, lovely sequencing instruction stuff, the simulation stuff, which it admits even on the key, on the key stage one bit can be playing games, and there's no reason why not on key stage two. Rose's recommendations was we embed the whole of ICT across the curriculum. It still is a distinct body of knowledge. Look, we still have this notion of ICT capability over on the right-hand side there, finding selective information, creating, manipulating, processing, collaborating, which is the new word that came in, communicating, sharing, refining, and improving. It's a well-defined subject. I don't see what the expert panel are talking about. The Royal Society report, shut down or restart, says, no, let's change the whole thing. Let's move away from ICT and replace it with Three, di three distinct domains within that area. Information technology, which is distinct from ICT, the whole computer science thing, which is the focus of their report, and a much smaller sort of core of digital literacy, which they seem to interpret in very narrow terms, but I don't think those who really know about digital literacy would necessarily agree with them there. Computing at schools, a uh, group which are very much focused on promoting much more computing in primary and secondary school, have produced a curriculum. I've helped out with the key stage one and two bits, they take the computing bit and see that as comprised of those five areas, algorithms, programs, data, computers, networks, this is the sort of thing which we said they should learn in algorithms. So very much still a waterfall type approach to this. These are the sort of things which children should learn. NACE are also working on this. I happen to be chair of NACE this year, so I declare some degree of interest in this, putting digital wisdom there at the core of it. I think that's even higher than the digital identity and digital fluency stuff, which we've been hearing about this morning, being wise about how you use digital technology, and then that getting worked out through these three interrelated areas, digital life, digital tools, digital technology, and then a number of domains, areas of learning which wrap around that. And there's more detail on NACE's website if you'd like. I'm just going to skip through these because I'm conscious that time passes. And teachers doing this too. There's a whole gang of people using hashtags like rethinking ICT on Twitter to crowdsource what a new curriculum could look like for both primary and secondary. And I think that's the really exciting thing about what the Secretary of State is proposing to do with the disapplication of the programme study, that we get to start working with one another to say what it ought to look like. And um, Brian Charland and others talking about digital studies as the new subject. And this is a really interesting programme here. Meets them halfway through Key Stage 2, as we now call it. Takes them through Key Stage 3 with, look at those really interesting strands running through website development, multimedia production, app development, games development. And this notion of assessment has done through hack days um, at both the end of Key Stage 2 and end of Key Stage 3. Some really interesting, exciting, innovative thinking. So that sort of iterative development of moving on from where we are. It's worth saying, though, that even if the national curriculum isn't disapplied for ICT, it still doesn't apply to the majority of children in secondary schools and increasing number of schools. Um, if you're in a maintained primary school or secondary school controlled by the local authority, funded by the local authority, then yes, the national curriculum remains statutory. But in free schools, in academies, in the three remaining city technology colleges, and in all of the independent sector, there is no obligation to follow the national curriculum. So never mind the disapplication debate. We have for all increasing numbers of schools, increasing number of pupils, this notion that the national curriculum or the curriculum they follow is something which is determined by the school itself. Um, so what is the way forward? How could, you know, yes, we have this iterative development of let's take where we've got and make it better, but there are other ways of doing this, and I wonder if something from the agile development methodology might be 
a much more interesting, exciting way of going about curriculum thinking. So Agile Development says, look, the things on the right there are fine. Follow a plan, negotiate your contracts, document everything carefully, look at the processes, look at the tools. That strike you as familiar from how we have how we deal with curriculums and programs of study and schemes of work, yeah? Look at the stuff on the left and acknowledge that actually there may be a better way that thinking about individuals, thinking about the social interactions matters, thinking about getting something that works quickly matters, thinking about collaborating with our customers, oh, we call them learners or pupils or students or whatever, but collaborating with them is probably far, far better than sort of pinning things down on large pieces of paper. And yeah, responding to change, being, as it says at the top there, agile about these sorts of things. Even Mr. Gove himself, oh, no, this trip back in time, Plowden Report. Are there people old in, in the room old enough to remember Plowden Report? Okay, so there we go. At the heart of the educational process, lies the child. And is that not how we feel about school? Is that not how we see education? And the main educational task of the primary is to build on, strengthen children's intrinsic interest in learning and lead them to learn for themselves, which was one of Pete's two possible aims for education at the start there. So here we are, a word from uh, Mr. Gove, maybe. Um, volume. probably heard enough. Okay. Um, who here knows about open source software? That's really good to see. Who here gets the what I'm getting at on the slide here? Eric Raymond, Cathedral and Bazaar, yeah? One of the great metaphors for open so source software is the bazaar. What we have at the moment is a cathedral-like curriculum that has been designed by the great and the good for the greater glory of somebody or other. Michael Gove is proposing, or is hinting that he might allow us to move to something which is much more bizarre-like in its structure, that we each bring something there and each share something and each can contribute and choose and take from all that is available. And open source is a very powerful metaphor for thinking about it. So he talks about an open source world and a wiki approach to the curriculum. Open source has well, one of the definitions has these four freedoms at its heart, that we, have, we are free to run the programme. We're free to do with the curriculum whatever we will. And that's there free of charge, free as in beer, but also with freedom built in at its heart, free as in speech, as they say. You've also got access to the source code. You can see what the decisions are that have gone into the process that have made it work and you're free to share it with others. You're free to pass it on to other people and think what that means in terms of ICT programs of study, schemes of work, and you're free to make it your own, to improve it, to change it, to 
to develop it. And that's where it gets really very, very exciting because we can take this and, and make it better by access to the source code. Other people have thought about this too. Uh, Douglas Ruskoff, whoops, writing for um, Demos, talks about open source politics and his more recent book, Program or Be Program, I would highly recommend. Future Lab, Kerry Faces, former organization talking about open source approaches to education as well as to software design, really useful pamphlet. Other ideas too, some other things from Future Lab about it, the air inquiring minds approach to the curriculum, making children, making the learners co-developers of the curriculum of what is learnt in school. And do you remember the personalization stuff from a few years ago now? And um, people like Charles Ledbetter talking about, you know, look at the subtitle here, putting the learner at the heart of the education system. Does that not remind us of Plowden writing 40 years previous to this publication coming out. And the whole problem with personalization, as it was back in those sort of days of the, the former government, was we have this idea that the curriculum should be personalized to each child, or education should be personalized for each learner, and yet a statutory national curriculum that every child has to follow. Perhaps a disapplied approach, a more agile approach, makes that personalization much more Possible. And then we have Stephen Downs and George Siemens talking about um, connectivism as a learning theory for the digital age, that the way we learn these days is different because all of you can tell me the date of the Battle of Bosworth you know, within 30 seconds of me asking the question. We have access to knowledge. We don't necessarily all have, or the children that we're working with in school don't necessarily all have the wisdom to use that well and to know what's right, to know how to use that access to information, to knowledge. But we do have this. So as knowledge continues to grow and evolve, access to what is needed more important than what the learner currently possesses. And finally, my journey here, Roehampton to Plymouth. This, you know, it was a very much a follow the road, follow the instructions. This is how we travel these days. The little device in the car tells me, you know, where to go, when to turn, what to do. I think we think about education very much in these terms as a, as a learning journey, as a lifelong journey of learning, as one thing after another. This is what curriculum means, if anything, is the course, the, the, the course that we follow. But there's a landscape to explore there, and I think education is much more about exploring landscapes than following journeys. So when we think about curriculum, I think we find ourselves on the left-hand side here very often, thinking about time, thinking about a learning journey, thinking about our lessons. But perhaps something of education is over on the right-hand side there. So rather than it being a linear, temporal set of metaphors of one thing after another, Think of it in terms of a spatial collection of metaphors, of a landscape to explore, of things to discover. Acknowledge that the locus of learning can be the library as much as it can be the classroom, where the learner can genuinely be in charge of what they're learning about, and what they're teaching themselves as much as what they're being taught. I have gone on and on and on. I really have. And you've all been very patient and all listened very, very quietly. Um, if you want to get in touch, there's a Twitter URL and an email address there. Pete, do I have time to take questions or have I got to sit down and let somebody else have a go? One and a half minutes. One and a half minutes. Okay. I'll try and answer quickly if you can ask something quickly. How do you know the Raspberry Pi Oh, I love the Raspberry Pi. I might have one waiting for me when I get home. I'm really, really hoping. I, I, um, I think the Raspberry Pi fits in over on that right-hand side, yeah? that it, it's so much of, of my learning took place in a library rather than in a school or a classroom or a lecture room. And, sorry? Yes, it does. And it's, it's putting the technology there in the hands of the learner. It's no longer the school as the only place where they can be taught to do these things. You know, my earliest experience of programming, okay, actually that was at school. But a lot of the programming that I learned was on my little BBC micro up in my bedroom. And this is what's going to happen with the Raspberry Pi, I hope. Pete. Dark Miles is my concern over the move to push back into the school and the
And there's something about the fact that they taught themselves that makes them good at it. Because you have to be able to unlearn something, relearn something else, accept that something you can't do and figure it out, otherwise you won't be successful. And the second they put it back in schools and put it as part of the same turgid process as maths and English, we're going to lose that. I and know. No good giving kids the language if they don't have the spirit. Yeah. I know it goes against the sort of spirit of PELP 12 where we're all being very pessimistic and confessing our failings and so on, but at heart I'm an optimist. I don't think even maths education, even English education has to be turgid in school. It can be done incredibly well. And I think coding can be taught incredibly well. Okay, the last half hour I focused very much on curriculum and that was the title of the talk. But the really interesting thing when it comes to coding in school is not going to be saying, let's have coding on the ICT curriculum. The really interesting thing is going to be, how do we teach that well in a way that children will get enthusiastic about? Um, yeah, everybody who's a musician didn't just learn their music in school. Everybody who becomes a poet didn't just learn to write poetry in school. But it might have given them the original seed of an idea. I'm going to sit down and let somebody else talk. Thank you.